We interrupt this Tampa coronation for a bit of a gyration. That fellow there, Ron Paul, uh, uh, someone had uh, thrown a lay on him uh, to say he is uh, greeted here favorably as a rock star here most definitely. Ron Paul telling me he likes this ticket. That doesn't mean he is supporting this ticket. Ron Paul, minutes ago. I didn't know what to expect. I knew we had a few friends here, but I was surprised with the enthusiasm and very pleased. Who got you the Hawaiian lay? Who did that? Somebody. (laughs) Someone in the Hawaii delegation. Yeah. Um, You are, uh, you know, backing the ticket, but you're not wholeheartedly enthusiastic about it. Is that about right? No, that's that's about it. I haven't endorsed the ticket, and uh, I endorse the principles I've been talking about for a long time, a lot of times on your show, and you know basically what that is. I'm endorsing, you know, peace and prosperity and individual liberty, the Constitution, and I'm more intense on that than I am on the politics of it. So uh, in, a, in a way, as I drift away from the political action, I might even feel more comfortable. There's some things in politics that aren't a whole lot of fun. There's a lot of infighting. I never enjoy that. There's a little bit of that going on now, but I would just assume talk about business problems, economic problems, and the business cycle. Those are the things that really stir my interest. Um, you, you prefaced your remarks, Congressman, saying uh, you're, you're not quite on board with this ticket then. Does it mean you could leave this convention not supporting it? No, I've, uh, I'm not intent, intending to endorse uh, anybody. Well, do you have any horse in this race you like? You mean in the total race? Well, Barack Obama, uh, Mitt Romney. I'm not. I'm not at this moment. I have no plans to endorse anybody, and have And I think most people realize but that. But you're going to vote. I will uh, probably vote. I've done that in the past. Uh, and I, would you err more on the side of Mitt Romney, or or not on certain issues? But just remember. But is there a possibility you could vote for Barack Obama? Not too likely. <laughs> okay. Is there a possibility you could vote for the Libertarian candidate Gary Johnson? Well, there's, there's always possibilities of everything, but I haven't made up my mind. Put me down as undecided. But let me just tell you what happened in 76. I, uh, Ford was president, right. and I was a big Reagan supporter. Went to the convention. But back then, I wasn't, uh, nobody could really care. I never endorsed the ticket. You know, and it was a non-event. I just didn't endorse it because Reagan was my Well, guy. you're a much bigger deal now. You're a national figure. Yeah, but that's only because you get me on your show all the time. <laughs> but in all seriousness, Congressman, um, the candidates, for Mitt Romney or Paul Ryan himself, in just an interview yesterday, was talking about this notion that, yeah, those enthusiastic backers of yours will rally around as you will rally around this ticket. They're confident you will and they will. Are they overconfident? Are they mistakenly confident? They might be jumping the gun a bit. What do you because want? I, because, what do you want to hear out of them? Because I'm not a block. I don't own my delegates. I'm a little bit different. I don't have. All right, I have these delegates. I'm going to release them. I can't release anybody. I don't own anything. They're going to do what they want to do. And if I do something that they don't think is consistent, I'll lose credibility, and they won't do what I well, tell them. Well, your backers anyway. telling you, sir? Don't, oh, I think don't they're sign on board with this ticket. I think they're very independent. I think some uh, are in that position. Some might, and some might go to different parties. But uh, they're, they're individuals, and uh, when they asked me what to do, I said, do what you want to do. You know, I don't, I don't see this as, uh, I see this, I see what I do as a more of an intellectual movement. And, and we talk about revolution because we need a revolutionary change in our ideas. We just can't go along with the status quo. And when you come down to monetary policy and foreign policy and spending and debt, the tradition, the Republicans and Democrats haven't had a whole lot of difference. You know, in fact, your criticism of Paul Ryan when he was picked was not that he cuts too much, but that he doesn't cut nearly enough. Yeah, matter of fact, you, you interviewed me on the right. day we voted. And, and your, your, your point is well taken because over 10 years, even with the Ryan plan, uh, no, that does 30. save five trillion off spending over ten years, but we still have more spending than we do this year. Yeah, but it was thirty years to get to a balanced budget. So, and you argued that's way too long. Ah, oh, way too long, and there were no cuts. It was, uh, see, uh, one point that I try to talk about is baseline budgeting, and that should appeal to logic. Why should you have a baseline that's going up steadily, and anything you cut from the baseline is a cut? So they get nearly hysterical if you if you increase a hundred billion dollar budget to a hundred a hundred and fifty. In other words, curve the growth. Yeah, that's not cutting. No, it's not. No, you're right about that. You're right. But is this party 
by the argument for Mitt Romney, Congressman, picking Paul Ryan was to show that he had that that conservative gravitas, that uh, anti-spending gravitas. You don't buy that, it sounds like. Not, not according to what my speech was on the floor about the Ryan budget, because I, I, I voted against it, because it didn't, didn't really cut anything. Uh, but the Democrats fall into the trap. The Democrats become uh, the group that solidifies his reputation by saying, oh, my Lord, look at what this Ryan does. You know, the Ryan is slashing the budget. Conservatives say, hey, that's our guy. But the Democrats give him his reputation, but he's only talking about cutting proposed increases. They're not real cuts. And, of course, I'm interested in less militarism. I don't think we should fight undeclared war. So there's places where if you – I'm convinced that if anybody's sincere about cutting, they have to talk about baseline budgeting. They have to be willing to cut domestic and foreign expenditures. Otherwise, they don't think this is very serious. And you know – that I believe it's very serious because I believe that we're going to get into a much worse crisis than we had in 08. It's approaching quickly and it's a spending problem. And if we get into the same situation as Greece, it's a much bigger deal because we are the biggest economy and we have the reserve currency. That's what we should be talking about. But because they don't do this cutting and they're not serious, they either don't understand or they're just willing to delay it or figure, oh, I can't win if I actually cut something. You know, everybody yells and screams. You know, if you cut one weapon system, oh, you're going to destroy the troops. Well, how do you feel about these sequestration cuts, these automatic cuts? Many in your party have argued the defense cuts are draconian. They're too severe. Uh, where do you stand on that? I, I think that's silly talk because there are no real cuts. They're just cuts in the proposed increases, and that's where the problem is. So they fight, they delay, they get to, they get the deficit level increase, the, the uh, debt level increase, and they agree to sequester funds. And then guess who wants to re remove that? Liberal Democrats and conservative right. Republicans. They both agree. They didn't like the rules. Do you think we have this debt clock running in here, Congress? And I think that is, in, a, in, in, in all reality, a difference to you and the issue that you've made it. But, you know, $16 trillion is a lot of money. And do you think we'll ever, ever get that paid off? Oh, absolutely not. There's not a prayer. Governments never pay off the debt. But they liquidate the debt. You don't pay it off. You don't earn it. Like, if you and I get into trouble... But is there a way to boom your way out of it? Can you grow your way out of no, it? No, no, not at this level. The Romney level. ticket believes with tax cuts and the like, you can boom your way but out. But you can inflate your way out of it, destroy the value of the currency. If we owe $16 trillion, if you destroy hit 50% price inflation, your dollar lost 50%, you only owe a trillion dollars. Could you imagine if interest rates were higher, how much that debt would be? And uh, interest rates will go higher. Right. And they're, they're destined to go higher. Otherwise, we don't ever have to go to work again. Because we issue the reserve currency of the world, they're still selling us stuff, and they still, they still, you know, when there's a little shake in market, people still go to our treasury bills. That can't last forever. No, it can't last forever. Finally, your thought here at this convention, where whatever the agreements or disagreements, there's a lot of people who think the world of you here, but you don't have a huge speaking role here. Um, and I'm wondering whether they're, they're kind of soft peddling you I don't know what you call it uh, no no I don't have I don't have a it's not that I don't have a huge speaking role I don't have a speaking role uh, but they're anxious I think they're really anxious well they to count have the our stuff voters you do off-site that's what you're doing off-site but you don't feel have you you don't feel you've been treated well by the Romney campaign I don't worry too much about that and characterize it a certain way. Of course, my supporters think they treat us atrociously. And I sort of get, get it out of my system because we had a grand rally on Sunday night. But would you be angrier, Congressman, if not for your son and thinking about his future, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, and that maybe the better part of valor is to swallow your angst or pride, whatever you want to call it, so that he could carry the torch? Well, it, it might sound like I'm, I'm cool, uh, cold and callous, but guess what? <laughs> About the time he was 16, I sort of turned him loose. <laughs> and, and, away he's on, and he's on his own. So I can't 
bestow anything on him, and he's okay. doing a pretty good job, and he will not do things just as I have done it, and he has a pretty good reputation already, so there will be disagreements on strategies, so uh, I, I think that's, uh, that's pretty normal and understood. You know, Congressman, as the business nerd at Fox, what I've always appreciated about you covering your speeches and your primaries and caucuses, you're the only guy on the planet who could talk about the Federal Reserve and money supply and velocity of currencies and get standing ovations from young people. <laughs> I love it. If I could do that, my ratings would be like Jay Leno's. I'll tell you what I enjoyed on the write-ups on the rally we had the other night is they talk just about what you said, and he right. said, what is ma amazing about Ron Paul, he did this, talked for an hour and 15 minutes. I can't believe anybody would sit and listen to this. <laughs> but they said he never mentioned the president's name or Romney's That's name right. once. That's right. And and I never, that wasn't a plan, but that's just the way my mind works because, like, they want me, used to you always say, attack Bernanke, attack Bernanke. Right. No, Bernanke isn't the issue. It is the issue of fiat money and the monetary policy. Well, you, no. you're, you're, maybe your next career is beckoning a, a financial anchor at Fox. Well, well I thought you were going to send me to the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman, thank you very, very much. Very, very good God, seeing you. you. All right. <laughs>